Alaska. Good evening, everyone. I'm Allison Hepler. I'm a volunteer with Maine's First Ship and um, a recently retired faculty member at the University of Maine system where um, our speaker is from. Uh, Liam Rorden, Reardon, I have no idea what you were wrong, um, has been a faculty member at UMaine Orono since 1997, specializing in the broad era of the American Revolution from the 1750s to the 1820s with particular attention to connections across the British Atlantic world and to cultural history. His current research emphasis is on loyalists, which I find really interesting, those who oppose the Patriot movement. He's also done extensive research and community engagement work about Maine statehood and its bicentennial commemoration. If any of you participated in the Maine bicentennial, you have him to thank for that. And, and recognizing that he did it during some pretty difficult um, times. Uh, he also helps organize N National History Day in Maine, a statewide research contest for grades six to 12 students, and that's part of a national program. Liam also volunteers to support outdoor recreation at the Great Pond Mountain Conservation Trust in Orland and is currently living in Bangor. Um, the title of his talk is, as you can see, it's Picturing Maine's Indigenous Context, Colonialism and the Penobscot. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's a real treat for me to be here. Uh, this is my first time down to see Maine's first ship and it is really exciting to see such an incredible public history project that has this physical, tangible aspect to how we think about the past and how it gives us a mark of what remains the same, but also what is so different. So a real treat for me to be here tonight. And I really wanna thank the people who have come out in this really interesting structure, this uh, freight shed for transporting uh, 19th century railroad freight from the train to the ferry and points beyond. It's really a fun setting to be here to talk a bit tonight about early Maine history and in particular, the meaning of colonialism in the context of Maine's past. So as Allison mentioned in her introduction, I'm a, an early American historian at the University of Maine, and I arrived there in the fall of 1997. And as I think about the content of today's talk, what I'm really struck by most of all is how fundamentally the field of early American history has changed in the 20 or 30 years since I've been a faculty member at UMaine. And in particular, that change has come from two really driving forces changing our historical imagination. One of these was the rise of a field called ethno-history, which combined anthropology and history in terms of methods and subjects and types of research questions that we asked. And secondly, has been the emergence of Native American studies. And the really crucial thing about Native American studies in the past generation has been its emphasis on the scholarship, creative work, and political activism of Indians in the present day. And what this has meant is that contemporary indigenous leadership has advanced a totally different understanding of colonialism that then was the standard in the 1990s when I trained. And what I really want to imply with the title that I have here today connects to this new understanding. And that is to emphasize that colonialism remains an active force in our contemporary society. It's not as if in 1776 or 1783, that was the end of the colonial circumstances of North America. 
So that really informs what I want to do today in my talk. It's really organized around four or five key images, and I'm happy to stop along the way and talk more about them. We'll leave time at the end to talk as well, but it's often more fun to take a pause and have a discussion in the middle by the time a long-winded professor ends a full lecture everyone's so exhausted they can't really ask a question or they've forgotten what they were confused about or curious about so please for those of you who are here if you put your hand up i'll finish the thought i'm trying to get out and we can take a pause and i'll take a question and we can revisit it so I want to start by going quite a distance back in time, even a century before the boat was built in Popham that's here as a reconstruction. And that is to think a little bit about the very first documented European voyages that arrived in what we now know as Maine. So this early world map of 1529 has a strong debt to two early voyages along the coast of northeastern North America. And in the top left corner of the slide is a detail of the sort of Nova Scotia main coast as we would describe it today. And those three sort of island looking features with trees on top of them, each indicate a voyage of a particular European. So the one in the middle in the detail refers, describes it as the Tierra de Corta Real. That was a voyage in 1501, during which 50 indigenous people were seized, probably from the coast of Maine, and taken back to Europe. And one of the striking things about that 1501 event is that the indigenous people who were captured had a piece of a sword and a number of silver rings. So even in 1501, there was already some kind of contact with European made goods. And then to the left of that is the Tierra de Estevan Gomez. He sailed from Spain in late 1524. And the again, it's a little hard to see in this detail, but there's a very sharp V shape to the Penobscot Bay. And that really came from Gomez's uh, cartography and would linger on uh, maps for another century, kind of an exaggerated uh, conical V shape to the Penobscot Bay. And in Gomez's voyage, he took an even larger number of indigenous people, 58 men and women survived the voyage back to Spain, probably seized on an island in the Penobscot. And again, we sort of suspect that one reason Estevan Gomez was able to capture such a large number of people is that they were familiar with the idea of trading and some kind of peaceful exchange with these ships that came along the coast, even in the first decades of the 1500s. Now, when Gomez got back to Spain, he discovered that enslaving Indians violated the law of the King of Spain. And so he tried to sell these people as enslaved property, but they were freed in the city of Toledo. We have evidence that they were there a year later, but they probably never returned to North America. Now in the top right corner of this slide is a monument in Bangor that was a gift from the Portuguese community in New Bedford, Massachusetts to commemorate Estevan Gomez as the first known European to sail up the Penobscot River. And in June of 2020, the Penobscot ambassador, Molly and Dana, raised the issue about the inappropriateness of the memorial in a Bangor Daily News op-ed 
and before the Bangor City Council. And this led by December of 2020 to the removal of the monument. It's now being stored at the Bangor Historical Society. And in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see the park with the memorial in the far distance before it was removed. And in the foreground is an interpretive sign that has been graffiti, has a big black X on top of it. So we're gonna kind of come back to those interpretive signs a little bit later in my talk. Now I wanna switch gears a bit to a very different sort of map of Northeastern North America to help situate us in this region from a somewhat different perspective. And here I am taking from the terrific scholarship of Lisa Brooks. She's a person of Abenaki descent and an English professor at Amherst College. A lot of her scholarship she's made available free on her faculty website, including a huge number of really fascinating maps. So if that interests you, I encourage you to Google around and take a look. And this sort of overview of the Northeast from her book, The Common Pot, really reorients us to how I think most people situate Maine and sort of their geographic imagination. Like rather than see it with state boundaries and roads and the international boundary is sort of the end of the United States, here, Maine is at the center of a large space that is interconnected above all by waterways. And so for people who care about the Maine's first ship project, I think there's something really exciting about this, that the river network of the Northeast was a indigenous superhighway that connected people that there was long distance trade, long distance political relationships, long distance social relationships, and these fundamentally were driven by water transportation. So this sort of closes the introductory section of my talk, thought a little bit about the earliest documented European presence of the early 16th century. So quite a bit earlier than English speakers often think about when was a European presence in what would become the United States. And then we've taken a look at a way that that extremely early moment of indigenous enslavement from 1525 became a hot political issue only two years ago. And then finally, this map to help us think a bit about the Northeast as an indigenous space and one that was integrated by water transportation. Now, the body of my talk has a narrower focus, looking at the colonial presence of English speakers in the Penobscot Bay and River region. And this starts with a critical traumatic moment in 1755, almost 250 years after the Gomez kidnapping. So think about that kind, you know, how does a community have a historical memory of what does it mean to have Europeans in your homeland? You've got those very early experience of enslavement, all sorts of contact, some of it conflict-based, some of it cooperative, but for indigenous people in the Penobscot watershed, a direct and sustained encounter with English speakers really didn't begin until the middle of the 18th century. That is when the heart of the Penobscot homeland was on the cusp of its first long-term and permanent wave of English-speaking settlement. So the regional 
English presence begins with this infamous proclamation from the Massachusetts government. Colonial initiation of what would become the Seven Years' War emboldened leaders of Massachusetts and Nova Scotia to implement genocidal policies in the mid-1750s that aimed to change the balance of power in the Wabanaki homeland. Massachusetts issued this proclamation on November 3rd, 1755, that offered premiums for Penobscot men, women, and children who would be brought to Boston as captives for enslavement. So an adult Penobscot man who could be sold into slavery by Massachusetts authorities, they would reward a colonist with a payment of 50 pounds for doing that. And even more shocking is that the Massachusetts government offered lesser sums for the scalps of men, women, and children, just 20 pounds for the scalps of women and boys under the age of 12. This scalp bounty came at the start of the sixth Anglo-Wabanaki War, the last of the nearly continuous wars launched by New England colonies into the Wabanaki homeland of the Northeast from 1676 to 1760. And it's on the heels of this proclamation and the Seven Years' War that the first British forts were built on the upper portions of Penobscot Bay, both of which are historic sites today. So Fort Pownall was built in 1759, is in modern day Stockton Springs. It's now Fort Point State Historic Park. And Fort George built in 1779 in modern day Castine. Now take one last look at the Phipps Proclamation of 1755 as we turn to a piece of artwork created in 2020 that remakes that proclamation in a dramatic new way. This recent painting by Penobscot artist and historian James Fran Eric Francis Sr. testifies to the Penobscot's triumph over the genocidal goal of the 1755 proclamation. The painting appropriates and transforms the government's broadside as its background with a red human figure on its surface and a Penobscot word translated as we walk on eternally emblazoned across its surface. So 1755 was the starting point for significant sustained English impact on the Penobscot. 2020 is the date of this artwork that indicates the force of that proclamation in the present day collective memory of the Penobscot nation. Now, if we return to the 18th century, I want to ask the question of what was the situation for indigenous people on the Penobscot River in the wake of that 1755 proclamation? There was an acceleration of English settlement in the region, especially in the immediate area around Fort Pownall. And there were scattered European settlements on the Blue Hill Peninsula and further east. But at the time of the American Revolution, 20 years after this proclamation, Wabanaki tribes still held the balance of power in the revolutionary Northeast. And this is really wonderfully demonstrated by the Watertown Treaty of July 1776. Both the emergent patriot government and British authorities worked really hard to build alliances with Wabanaki people during that opening phase of the Civil War of the American Revolution. And this Watertown conference was going on already 
when news arrived from Philadelphia that the Continental Congress had declared independence. So one of the interesting features of the Watertown Treaty of 1776 is that it is the first international recognition of the sovereignty of the United States, that the Maliseet and Micmac chiefs who are, here we have the signatory page to the treaty, who signed this document, pledge their allegiance and support and recognition of the United States as a newly sovereign nation. Now that Wabanaki relationship with the Patriots was always a contentious issue, right? There was not a absolutely uniform, 100% agreement with that. It varied over time. It varied among different Wabanaki tribes, and it even varied within Wabanaki tribes. But when the Patriots allied with France in 1778, that was a real spur to the Wabanaki commitment to the Patriot movement. Many Wabanaki people by the late 18th century had been Catholic and had been French speakers for several generations. And so the entry of France into the American Revolution as a formal ally of the United States in 1778 was a crucial strategic turning point, both in the region and throughout the Atlantic world. This was no longer a small, isolated civil war among English speakers. Now Britain had to fight on a much larger scale. Now, the unintended consequence of Wabanaki support for the Patriots is that U.S. success in the American Revolution led to massive new migration of English speakers into Maine, and especially into the region east of the Kennebec River. It is really only in the last two decades of the 18th century and the first half of the 19th century that English speakers arrive in the Penobscot River and Eastern areas of the Donland in substantial numbers. So English colonialism has a much later starting point than we might typically assume in the Penobscot Valley. And it largely followed and built upon US national success in the American Revolution in 1783 and Maine statehood in 1820. The diplomatic relationship documented in this treaty in 1776 with state state sovereign relations crumbled in the face of a more active and direct colonization in the decades around 1800. Now the next image returns us to Bangor and was made 15 years after Maine became a state at a time when the English speaking population on the Penobscot River was booming. This drawing shows a location about a mile and a half up the Kanduskeg stream from that recently removed Gomez Monument in Bangor. This sketch was by the artist Alvin Fisher. His cousin was a famous Blue Hill minister, Jonathan Fisher. And Alvin made this sketch when he visited Bangor in 1835. And it's titled at the top very faintly, Lover's Leap, Kanduskeg River, August 1835. Now, this idea of a lover's leap is an extraordinarily widespread phenomenon of the 19th century. There are hundreds and hundreds of lover's leaps all across North America, and in fact, all across the world. And it actually goes back to uh, a Greek story about a lover's leap. 
but the version of it that is particularly strong in the United States is coupled with a sense of tragedy and the inevitability of the extinction of indigenous people. Sometimes it's two Native Americans who fall in love and it's prohibited by the woman's father who's a chief, so they leap to their death. Sometimes it's a white settler and a Native woman. But deeply embedded in this is the sense of the disappearance of Indians. And this lover's leap that Fisher records in 1835 would become a major landmark in Bangor over the course of the 19th century. Tourist postcards identifying the lover's leap, poems about the lover's leap. And in fact, this phenomenon becomes so widespread that Mark Twain makes fun of it in Life in the Mississippi. You know, he's a great anti-colonialist. And he, he lampooned this idea that everywhere he went on the Mississippi, there was another lover's leap. So we have one version of that here in Bangor. And this remains the way this site is described in Bangor to this day. This is the essentially the same view on the left that uh, I took a photo of a year or two ago that uh, Alvin Fisher paint sketched in 1835. And here we have another of these interpretive markers that identifies this location as Lover's Leap Park, repeats the story of the star-crossed lovers prohibited to marry by the father of the woman who was an Indian chief, and they jump to their death. And so this is a deeply problematic example of a kind of colonial imagination that presumes Indians are always on their way to disappear. So what might we put in the place of this? How should we possibly re-describe it as something other than Lover's Leap Park? I mean, there's any number of possibilities. One would be to talk a bit about the meaning of the word Kanduskeg, right? So the Kanduskeg stream, which we see here, bisects Bangor, runs into the Penobscot River. And interestingly, Kanduskeg is a Maliseet word that refers to the little eel river, a place where eels could be caught. And that's striking because obviously the Kanduskeg River on the western side of the Penobscot River, we would think of more traditionally as part of the Penobscot homeland. So why would this place have a Maliseet name? There's also a Penobscot name for the stream that refers to it as a place of parsnips. Another possibility, rather than focus on Indians that didn't really exist, again, this is a, a story that is not connected to actual people who ever leapt off the cliffs above the Kanduskeg, why not tell more of a story of an actual Indian person who lived in this region in the exact same period. So those of you who were at the preceding lecture by Bunny McBride heard a bit about Molly Molasses. This is Molly Molasses's daughter, uh, sometimes identified as Mary Nicola, sometimes Sarah Molasses, sometimes as Sarah Molasses. Uh, painted in 1830 by a Bangor portrait maker. And it is not a great reproduction on our slide, but it clearly shows a woman of some status, of some beauty, wearing real finery of the era. So she has 
wampum necklaces. She has quite a bit of trade silver on her blouse, also the band in her hat, the very distinctive beaver hat. That was a indication of some of the wealth and skill of fur trapping in this region. And she was the daughter of Mary Molasses and James and John Neptune, who was the Lieutenant Governor of the Penobscot Nation at this time and a very influential Penobscot leader in this time. So for all of these reasons, she would stand out to us as a exceptional leading person of her day. But this did not protect her from the ravages of Bangor in her era. She was raped by a Bangor businessman, and her mother famously confronted this man regularly and forced him to pay to try to make some kind of amends for that violation. Now, another historical memory that I think would be right to elevate in place of the lover's leap image is one that's a particularly good one for tonight because it focuses on a canoe race along the Kanduskeg River. Uh, this is drawn from an extraordinary Bangor resident, John Martin, who has hundreds of pages of color sketches of individuals and events and scenes that occurred over several decades in Bangor. And he has this particularly, and, and the whole thing has been digitized and put online by the Maine Historical Society and the Maine State Museum. So if you're a history buff and want to lose you know, 30 hours of your life, take a look at this website, you'll really enjoy all the riches that it has. Uh, and he has this particularly great entry for July 4th, 1865. So that's the 4th of July after the Civil War has finally come to an end in April of 1865. And he is thrilled with what that day has meant for Bangor. He wrote, at the very top of his scrapbook, a day to be remembered by 50,000 persons and in which every member of my family participated during the entire day. And then he pastes in the newspaper account of what the Bangor celebration was like. And in particular, one of its elements is to talk about the Indian regatta. The newspaper says, Never was there an exhibition in Bangor so universally attractive as this. Its novelty drew a crowd of more than 20,000 people who covered the Kanduskeg Bridge and all the wharves, vessels, and buildings between the bridge and the mouth of the Kanduskeg. And then Martin gives us a sketch. All these people on the roof, on the deck of this you know, mill building on the banks of the river and four canoes being paddled down. The race was a grand success, the newspaper went on. Five canoes were entered for the prizes, each manned by two of the noblest and most stalwart young men of the Penobscot tribe, all sinews and ambition and fire for the contest. They raced down the Kanduskeg, across to Brewer and back, the boats were manned as followed. The General Grant by Stephen Stanislaus and Sabata Saul, the General Sherman by Sabata Solomon and J.M. Sokalexis, the General Sheridan by John Franzaway and Mitchell P. L. Susup, the Sharpshooter by Sapiel Sokalexis and Louis Sakabasin, Penobscot Boy by Newell Nicola and Horace Francis. So this is just a spectacular moment of Penobscot Indian visibility and participation in this end of the Civil War, 4th of July celebration in Bangor. You know, what does it mean 
for Bangor residents to see Wabanaki people participating in an activity with such a strong traditional component. And, and what does it mean that the annual Kanduskeg canoe race is a defining event for Bangor civic identity in the 21st century as well? So I have one last image for us to consider before I hopefully haven't exhausted you and we can have a discussion and conversation. Uh, and that is a famous landscape painting by Fitzhenry Lane of Castine in 1856. And Castine itself is a kind of fascinating name for that town. It gets that name after the American Revolution as a way for patriots to celebrate their alliance with the French. And it refers to the French colonial peasants in the area, especially the Baron de Saint Castine, who had arrived on the Penobscot in 1670, became an influential settler and trader, and whose adoption by the Penobscots and marriage to a tribal member helped him to become a cross-cultural leader. So in some ways, the town of Castine has embedded in it this other sort of colonial memory of an alternate sort of relationship where a French colonial elite could marry into a Penobscot family. Now, Lane's, Lane's landscape looks out from the British fort in, that had been built on the banks of the Penobscot in 1779, nearly two centuries after Castine had lived there. And in the detail that I've uh, highlighted for you here, we see two Penobscot women dressed in, in Victorian style, selling baskets to an Anglo-American woman. And so this documents a traditional cultural practice among Penobscot people that was also drawing on new artistic and commercial means to help sustain their people in the transformed circumstances of the mid 19th century. We know that Penobscot people continued a seasonal presence in this region at a place that they called Maja Bigwadus, camping on the cove just below the fort where they harvested seagrass for future use and selling baskets in previous years. In fact, Lane's friend, John Stevens, with whom he stayed when he visited Gastine, notes in his diary three years before seeing five Penobscot family camps in the cove just below the fort. So how do these images help us to reconsider colonialism and the Penobscot? Fundamental recent changes to our understanding of colonialism shaped above all by contemporary indigenous vitality should have profound implications for how we think about our past, our present, and our future. The persistence of indigenous people and their increasing effectiveness in using legal resources to protect their rights has been made clear in recent Canadian legal decisions, as well as in the US Supreme Court's McGirt decision of July 2020, that found that about half of the state of Oklahoma is Indian country. The simple but essential point that I want to make in closing is to reject the fundamental colonial belief in the so-called vanishing Indian, which presumes that all indigenous people will somehow become extinct in the modern world. Rationally, this doesn't make any sense, especially here in Maine, where Wabanaki people, nations, and traditions remain a strong presence in their homeland. Thanks very much. I appreciate your attention. So I'm happy to take 
questions, comments? We can... uh, these images, particularly the canoe race, are, are any of these now part of our current celebrations that we know of in uh, uh, contemporary Maine? I mean, have, have these and other aspects been brought back into uh, recognition? I mean, I would say of the so we, of the five images I have up on the screen, they're all known a little bit here and there in different sorts of circles. I mean, Fitzhenry Lane is a very famous 19th century landscape painter. So that is the most widely recognized. And, you know, that idea of the Maine maritime landscape or New England maritime landscape is a powerful one. The Hardy portrait of Sarah Palacios is certainly very well known by people who are into Maine history, but you know, I had never known about it or heard about it before coming to Maine. And I think the other three are relatively little known. James Francis's piece was on display at the Maine Historical Society during its uh, Maine Bicentennial exhibit and that survives in an online exhibit as well so it got some exposure there but the you know the alvin fisher sketch is black and white so that's not too interesting to people it's not known and i think the john martin sketchbook is just sort of this enormous trove of fascinating material but it's kind of overwhelming you have to like kind of dig into it and pull it apart so there there's sort of all levels i, I would say Back. Thank you for a very interesting, fascinating talk. Um, in terms of the, um, I would just call the deprivations um, on the Native American population. Could you comment a bit on you know what we increasingly learned about with um, the spread of disease and um, from the European settlers? Was that a major issue here? And uh, the second uh, somewhat related question is, could you comment a bit on the climate? Uh, literally, back then was probably a lot even more harsh, particularly in the winter, and the deprivations of that climate environment on, on the Europeans in particular. I'm assuming that the Native Americans had acclimated and, and knew far better how to exist. You mentioned the importance of uh, the rivers as a transportation system. Of course, they would be frozen in the winter, uh, by and large. And um, how did that work out? Were they still able to communicate? Thank you. So thanks for the questions. I'll, I'm going to take them in reverse order. So the second was about you know what was the physical experience of weather like in the 18th century in Maine, and how did that impact uh, colonists as well as their relationship with Native Americans? And you know I think this is one of those things that does peak our imagination the particularly in the 18th century this is the end of what is often called the little ice age so it was a period of real cold and it's stunning to think how could people have managed in a world without gore-tex and internal heating and all of the comforts that we have so you know there's no question that there was a sort of physical hardiness and endurance that, you know, I think most of us would find absolutely daunting. Um, you know, I do, you know, it is clear that Native Americans had adapted and really had developed technology to deal with the natural environment in which they lived that Europeans were totally impressed by. So, you know, that idea of the birch bark canoe that, you know, John McFay writes about so eloquently, you know, this was a extraordinary technology that 
was outstandingly suited to that landscape that we looked at in the earlier map. And when things turned to freezing and snow conditions, obviously you couldn't paddle those rivers, but the Wabanaki snowshoes were an absolute revelation to Europeans. Again, here was something that was created by human imagination and talent to thrive in circumstances that were otherwise very challenging. The, the, the first question you asked about the relationship of disease to catastrophic death rates among indigenous people has been the subject of some extremely interesting scholarship just in the last three, four years. And I really have changed how I have taught the concept of a demographic catastrophe as the fundamental engine of Native American death. And I don't think that that's a accurate explanation anymore. And I think it, it really is, uh, you know, that though, you know, those of us who have not gone for Micah have just lived through a pandemic, you know, we are very conscious of what does epidemic disease mean in terms of its impact on a society. And an epidemic by itself does not have 95% death rates, which is what good historians once said about the Native American historical encounter with European diseases. It, it is not just the disease, it is how disease intersected with policies of extermination, with generational poverty, with lack of food, with trauma of sexual violation, that that is what made the catastrophic death rates that we know existed. So, you know, I do think an earlier generation of historians, in a sense, were prepared to let colonists off the hook and to say, you know, it was just these diseases and it wasn't intentional. They didn't really have any control over it. And I think the more nuanced work we're seeing now is showing how disease intersects with other human decisions. And that's what led to the horrendous outcome that is clearly a demographic catastrophe. Thanks for the question. I have a question uh, from the uh, Zoom. Uh, could you define colonialism? And uh, wouldn't colonialism in British North America be different from British colonialism in India or French colonialism in uh, Algeria or Vietnam? So that is a great question. And I, you know, colonialism is a, you know, is a, a driving force for the contemporary world that we know. The expansion of Europe in, the wake of Columbus's voyage over centuries, you know, arguably coming to a close with the two world wars in the 20th century when that sort of imperial expansion was no longer seen as appropriate or the right kind of model for the future. You know, I, I do think it's real, you know, historians at the end of the day are really interested in the particular example and the particular detail. Historians are a little shy of sort of overarching models and big explanations that explains everything. So I do think it's really interesting to th think about varieties of colonialism. And I think that comparative analysis is one that can really be fruitful. Uh, you know, a sort of classic question to ask about indigenous people in North America is, is, it, is there any difference between a sort of longer British colonial rule in British North America that becomes Canada versus US independence and the kind of 
US-Indian relations that exist here. So there's, I think, a real good example of a kind of side-by-side -side comparison with a lot of similarities, some differences, and to think about, well, how does that make us reflect on differences in sort of national or imperial regime? And, you know, as I suggested with the example of uh, St. Castine, the Baron Pentagoet, you know, that was a very different kind of relationship and model. So I do, you know, I, I do like the particular examples and trying to think about uh, what they mean in a specific and tangible way rather than the sort of big picture one, one explanation sums it all up. So. I do, I do have a question now, again, from the uh, Zoom. Uh, did the Watertown Treaty refer to Watertown, Massachusetts? It did. So the Continental, the Patriot Government of Massachusetts couldn't meet in Boston because the British controlled Boston at the time. So uh, they had been meeting in Watertown, and that's where they had these negotiations. Uh, yep. Well, I have another question, Rob. I, I hope this isn't really too far tangent to your talk tonight, but it does seem to be your field of expertise. Is who were these English people who kept coming back? I mean, if they're getting burnt out, if they're getting killed, if their people are being kidnapped and sold to the French in Quebec, why do they keep coming back? I mean, uh, I would assume back then your average human never traveled 40 miles from home. Mm. And so what was, has anybody sort of studied like, who, who, and I, I was sort of wondering if there's any comparison between those people and the people crossing the Southern border now who mm. realize their, you know, their lives are in danger. They're not wanted. They may get cheated out of their pay. And, and all the rest. I mean, I'm curious if a lot of the colonials were just desperate. Kept I realize that's really... I, I'm, I'm happy to feel the question. Uh, so I think at the broadest level, the colonial world was a world in motion more than we might think. And even within most people who were migrating out of Great Britain had already moved a lot within Great Britain. So the idea that, you know, they weren't, you know, farmers who lived in one place for time immemorial and they made one great leap. They had already begun to be mobile within Europe and then made the leap across the Atlantic to come to North America. And so I think there was a real consciousness that there was opportunity in mobility. And so I think there's a, a, a real engine to move. In the specific case of Maine in the sort of post-American revolution period, all, the overwhelming majority of this tidal wave of migration that's coming to Maine is from Southern New England. And one of the census takers in 1790 um, in Maine, on his own volition, asked people where they had lived, where they had lived or where their parents had lived. And so we've got a very good sense of, you know, they're coming from particular towns in Cape Cod, they're coming from particular towns in Southern New England, and then they're moving and resettling here, seeing, Wabanaki land as wilderness that is not being put to good use and therefore is providing an opportunity for them to continue a kind of yeoman farmer model of economic development. Yes, Ken. He's done. Any other questions? Liam, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, I, I certainly appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you.